So this is me, I'm Skyler, and uh, I've worked at these places um, over the course of my career. I've, uh, I've currently started this project called Mock in a Bio with a couple of uh, friends of mine, partners that we're working on. Um, and I've been in tech for a long time. I got my first computer when I was four years old. My dad put it in front of me and said, take it apart. And I got the opportunity to start thinking about problems that I hadn't had the opportunity to think about before because I had access to this computer, this early Commodore 64. But having been in tech for a long time, I've started to see a problem. There's this gap. It's a knowledge gap amongst people who have access to technology like computers and research technology and people who don't. And the people who don't really have a hard time getting knowledge, learning about how they can use these kinds of technology. And part of that problem comes from the fact that schools just don't have the money for a lot of this kind of research tech. They can't afford things like cell incubators like you'd use for biotech. They can't afford a lot of the really big 3D printers. They can't afford a lot of really cool computers that they might want to use. So we decided to do something about that. At Machina Bio, we came up with some, some designs for 3D printable machines, and we open sourced the designs. Uh, and why that's really important is because we can do some really interesting things with these designs. So this is an example of one of them. This is a cell incubator. It's a heat chamber. It's uh, totally open source. It's totally 3D printed, and it's controlled by a Raspberry Pi, a little $35 computer you can get off of the internet. And uh, it's, it's totally, I would say, cheaper than the alternative. One of the really cool things about it for biotech and why I think this is important in industry, this is an example of what I call handmade hardware in a biotech lab. Lots of researchers do this. They create their own different kinds of hardware. I've seen it. I've worked with these folks. And it really makes it hard to reproduce lab results from one lab to another. So by using open source technology, we can replace that technology with something that they can download, modify, print out, and then share that exact design with somebody else. And then they can scale it. This is another example of a different version of that heat chamber that I was showing you before, our earlier version of the prototype of the, the incubator. So uh, this is it's really easy to modify if you have any experience in CAD. And you can really, there are a lot of CAD tools today that can make this very easy to do. One of the other big perks about it is because we're 3D printing, you're only paying for the cost of material itself. So this is an autoclaving device. It'll clean itself. The comparable device today is ten to $15,000. The material cost for this device alone is only one to 2000 Because it's open source, we're not charging like licensing fees. There's no vendor lock-in. But if you use different kinds of materials, you get some really interesting applications out of this. And open source lends to different kinds of collaboration. So some of the materials can make it food safe. You have a hot, closed environment that's food safe. That's an oven, like an easy bake oven. And uh, it's even dishwasher safe, which I think is kind of cool. So I started thinking about this, and I came up with a really interesting theory about how we could use this in an unconventional way. And it's in home ec. I think that these are the kinds of things that schools can afford. They're not super expensive. They can replace these big ovens with them, and they can use them to make pizzas and burgers and cookies and all this kind of stuff. And then they can use the same exact interface in a bio class a couple of years later, same hardware. And then the students get to learn a different application. They start getting exposed to problems that they haven't been exposed to previously. And then, once they're using it in school, they can start using it in industry. And because it's open source, there's no vendor lock-in. They don't have to worry about licensing fees. This is how Autodesk won CAD, by the way. They're like, they gave it to schools. And schools went, yeah, all right, we'll teach the students that because we have it. And now the students ask for that because it's what they know. So one of the big power plays, I guess, of open source is that anybody can get it. They can modify it. They can share it. They can contribute back. That allows for all these different kinds of designs. People are going to come up with versions that I can't imagine. You none of us here are going to think of it. But part of it, what, what's going to give that, that, them that opportunity is that they're going to be exposed to problems that we don't know yet. We haven't encountered them yet. But they're not thinking about them today. And by having these hardware pieces in front of them, these machines, these motors, these heat chambers, we like to think that we're giving them vehicles for solving the problems of the future so that they can really think about the things that we haven't encountered. How would you solve cancer? How would you target those cells? How would you give people the opportunity to think about that? These are the things I would, I would say are the thing to do that. By giving them access to these tools, the tools of today, 3D printing and open source, we are helping them solve the problems of tomorrow. That's the only way we're going to get there. So um, you can reach out to me on Twitter. I'm happy to answer any questions about applications. This is all my contact info. Um, and where you might, if you want to be a pilot, you can reach out to me as well, and we'll talk about what you can do to get one. Thank you.